how long will the door remain open? This is yeah. the thing. I mean, yeah. I don't know how the door is going to be remaining open right. in America before we hear that the Bible is a hate speech. Mm -hmm. It's already in some countries, like in Finland mm -hmm. and other European countries. Certainly, it's beginning to bud in Canada. Yeah. So we would love to walk through that door as long as God keeps it open. Yeah and take advantage of it. Mm. Because if we go to sleep, yeah. we'll wake up and we have missed a great opportunity. Yeah. Hello and welcome to Candid, where we never settle for less than the truth. I'm your host, Dr. Jonathan Youssef. Each week we'll tackle tough issues, answer your hard questions, and take a candid look at the Christian faith. Here we are and we have our most illustrious guest. You're the reason that Candid exists, Dr. Michael Youssef. Thank yeah. you for segmenting time in your busy schedule to come and sit down. This is the first time we're not talking about one of your books, I think. <laughs> That's um, good. <laughs> so we wanted to do something different. Sure. But thank you for being on my, your podcast. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah. <laughs> Today, I want to talk about evangelism, and you were just sharing some information with me about how yeah. people are very much intimidated by that term. The word, yeah. Yeah. It's misconstrued, misunderstood, yeah. all of the above. Yeah. How about start out by telling us how the Lord fanned that flame in you? Well, really, if I'm truthful with my history, it's 60 years ago. Mm -hmm. And it was 60 years ago, that's in 1964, March 4th specifically, when I heard a sermon about the judgment of God. Mm -hmm. You know, so many people come to Christ because of the love of God, and that's wonderful. I thank God for that. There are some, I even heard about some famous musician who came to the Lord, a very vulgar guy, but who came to the Lord and converted thoroughly because he heard a sermon on hell. Mm. So it doesn't matter which way you come to the Lord. I came to the Lord because of a sermon that is about how one day the door of mercy will be shut and grace will no longer extend it. Mm. So the time is now. Mm. And I guess because that is impacted me instead of leaving the church early as I told my brother I would do, I went forward. And uh, from that day on, I've always been motivated, always been burdened, really, to be quite honest. It's a burden that I carry mm. that I don't want people to miss out, mm. that if there's a chance, this is the opportunity. Now, I believe God is sovereign. Mm -hmm. That's why we pray for God to work in people's lives. Mm -hmm. But also, God uses us yeah. as we witness. Go and make disciples of the nations. Exactly. Yeah. And that is obedience, really. But, uh, you know, here's what you said earlier about the word evangelism is so intimidating. And I don't like big words anyway. But my uh, definition of evangelism comes from D.L. Moody. Mm -hmm. And Dio Moody was a simple guy. He was a real businessman, entrepreneur. He was kind of a man's man. He, he was not a, you know, armchair theologian. Mm -hmm. And once he said, evangelism is not all that big a term. All it means is one beggar telling another beggar where to go and get food. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's just that simple. Yeah. That, you know, I was lost in sin and Christ saved me. He can save you. Mm -hmm. Come to him. Mm-hmm. Repent, yeah. turn, in faith. Yeah. So that's really the simple definition. We complicate things at times, but yeah. uh, generally speaking, I try to be as simple as I can. Well, the root word, euangelion, right? Yeah. I mean, it's the good news. You're just good newsing someone. Yeah. To D.L. Moody's point, you're telling them the good news of exactly. There's they're in a world rife with bad news. Right. There is good news. There is good news if you accept it. Yeah. But it's really bad news if you reject it. Well, it is always good news. Yes. Right. And whether you accept it or reject it. Right. But right. if you reject it... It's bad news for you. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So it is good news if you avail yourself to that news. Yeah. Well, over the last several years, you have been very intentional about even the specific command of literally sure. going to the nations. Right. And you've gone to the nations. Yeah. You've done several evangelistic 
events. Events. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about those, and then we'll transition to kind of where Leading the Way is heading with that right. evangelism trajectory. It's always the burden of my heart, whatever I preach and whenever I preach. But several years ago, I felt God laid it on my heart that I need to go on the road mm -hmm. and not just be satisfied with evangelizing through television yeah. and radio and yeah. podcast and so on. Be in person, yeah. I want to be there in person. Mm. And then God opened so many doors, I literally had to run and say, oh, I can't do all this physically, <laughs> humanly. Yeah. And so we were selective. And we've seen God do some amazing things in Dublin and Ireland and, and in Belfast and in uh, London and Australia and, and um, Egypt particularly. We had a historic event in which we were anticipating 12,000 people and we thought that would be the largest gathering in the history of Cairo. We ended up with almost for a Christian 18, event. For a Christian event. Yeah. You cannot allow to have right. Christian events outside, outside of a church. Or school, yeah. And the largest church, you know, will see a couple of thousand people. So, But to have cross denominations, cross boundaries in every mm -hmm. sense of the word. Mm -hmm. And then we thought, if we get 12,000, and we were planning for 12,000, but then we had over 18,000 registered. So mm -hmm. we realized we were in trouble and we had to rush and put seats and every little corner and mm. and open up new places and yeah. by um, satellite and so forth. And even though it was broadcast live to millions of homes in the Middle East and the Arab world, but nonetheless, the physical attendance of 18,000 people, which had never happened before, Christian people, mm. or a Christian event, uh, really gave a lot of people, uh, you know, an encouragement to a lot of believers, but mm. also it made others take notice. Mm. And just think of, uh, you know, you think of the Great Awakenings and just the ripple effect that that creates for generations, yes. you know, thinking of what these events, you know, again, in particular, thinking of the Egypt event, what that will do for right. trajectories of families and yeah. not just individuals, but yeah. for generations. Generations to come, yeah. Well, so you have a new five-year plan yep. called the Open Door Campaign. Right. Tell us a little bit about the seeds of this. and, and Sure. I am conscious of the fact that the clock is running. Mm -hmm. And chronologically, mm -hmm. I am not going to be around a long time. Mm. And so, under God and His leadership, direction and prayer and seeking His mind and His will, uh, realize that uh, as the time is getting shorter, we need to focus. We need mm. to crystallize our focus. Mm. And we did. And so instead of, you know, 20 things so we're going to do, yeah. we focus on three things and three mm -hmm. things only. Mm -hmm. And the next five years. Now, if God spares me now, however, if the Lord takes me home, then you're going to have to do this. <laughs> I, I sort of well, already... We'll have to put Candid on hiatus at that point. <laughs> well, we, well, I just recruited you. Um, but... You know, if God spares me and I'm around, I would like to focus on those three important mm. things. First of all, I grieve over my adopted country. Mm. I genuinely grieve. And my wife will tell you that many times I'll be sitting there and I'll see something in the news, although I don't watch the news very often, and I just want to weep over the country over the condition of the country. Not just the country, but the condition of the church mm -hmm. in America. Mm -hmm. It is so uh, grieving to my soul, and I wonder how much grieving it is to the Lord himself, mm -hmm. that 4% of the population have a biblical worldview. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is absolutely grieving. Mm -hmm. And how that corresponds with a percentage that identifies as Christian. Exactly. Exactly, yes. And if, if you go down to the whoever claim to be Christians, mm -hmm. that 4% may go up to 12%. Mm -hmm. But think about it. 12% of those who claim to know the Lord have no biblical worldview because right. they don't read the Bible. Right. 8%. Just think about this. 8% yeah. read the Bible. Yeah. 
on a regular basis. Yeah. That is very sad. Now, so how would you have a biblical worldview yeah. if you're not reading the Bible? Yeah. And many rely on a little bit here and a little bit there. Yeah, a lot of superstition. And we, we've just done an interview with Michael Horton, and he was giving the statistics of, of um, just this idea of the spiritual but not religious and yeah. how, how many – Christians, Catholic, Protestant yeah. are falling for yeah. that syncretism thing, yeah. which is that by definition, you do not have a biblical worldview. Right. You have a faulty worldview. It's a self-worship, really. <laughs> self-worship, Because that's right. the spirituality, as they talk, the buzzword they yeah. talk about it, is my spirit. That's really yeah. what they're talking about. I'm the king and judge I of am all. a spirit, yeah. yeah. I arbiter of truth, and, and I make the final decision. Yeah, absolutely, right. and yeah. it's, an, it's, it's an idolatry in its worst form. Mm. And so I grieve over that. So we uh, wanted to do everything we can, including going on the road in America, yeah. to present godly and biblical worldview and call people to come to Christ. So you've got these citywide events that will yes. challenge local churches, not too dissimilar from what you've been doing internationally in right. terms of – and you and I have this uh, ecclesiology, meaning understanding of the what the church is. Exactly. That it's not Michael Youssef goes out on the road and just preaches and then vanishes. Absolutely And the people not. are left going, yeah. what? What yeah. just happened? Sure. But it's that the church comes in and right. says, we're going to be here to, to – um, take the pieces and Disciple get them connected the, yeah. to be included and be part of the living body of Christ. Sure. But you're also doing your Finding True Peace evangelistic projects. Right. That's uh, Secular television. That's, yeah. So that's going yeah. on. And, and most of our listeners have probably seen that if you're yeah. watching uh, Fox Business and Fox News. Fox and News. All these, yeah, I uh, run into people all the time. I do, too. Who, I saw your dad on TV. Well, well, <laughs> not only that, but uh, I had somebody coming down the elevator of my apartment building this morning, and they said, can I talk to you more about what you said on wow. that 30-second spot? 30 seconds. 30 seconds, this elderly couple. And I said, I'll be delighted to. So, you know, mm. and I hope that the people are going to a pastor and saying, you know, can you tell me what this yeah. thing about? And in every place mm. I went to or mm. I will go to, mm. it will be only as a result of pastors mm. saying, we need this. Yeah. Come, revive us, Come and then us, we'll yeah. take over, the, we'll pick up yeah. the pieces. Yeah. And so that's, that's what we're going to do. For example, when I was in Springfield, Massachusetts right. uh, last spring, there were 20 pastors from Boston mm. who came down on a bus and came down and they met with me afterward and said, Boston, we need you in Boston. Yeah. So we yeah. go into Boston in October 2025. Mm. And there'll be other cities like Pittsburgh. And, and these are places that you have not been for events, if I'm understanding right. So, some of them I went and spoke to pastors and yeah. the pastors' uh, appreciation yeah. lunch or mm -hmm. dinner. Mm -hmm. We had rallies, radio rallies in the old right. days. Right. But not this type of think, event. Yeah. And yeah. so Pittsburgh is on the uh, on the docket, and um, San Antonio, Texas, wow. and Fort Lauderdale. Mm. So these are the places where people are saying, yes, we would like to see this happen. Mm. And uh, any of our your listeners can call and say, you know, I'm willing to help bring this to our city. All yeah. pastors that are listening to us right now, yeah. you know, they can call me or call us here and say, well, we want that in our city. So that something that I am dedicating myself to that I will definitely be committed to mm -hmm. in the years to come as I preach less in the church and I'll do these events more mm -hmm. in the coming five years. And so needed. And, and I'm just thinking I've heard of missionaries from Korea and China who are actually sending their missionaries to America. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and, you know, uh, the well, largest churches in many cities, the largest church in Boston yeah. is a Korean church. Right. And right. so, yes, I mean, that is happening all yeah. over the place. Okay, so this is your North America campaign, right. your second sort of pillar of the three? Yes, which has been a burden of my heart for many, many, many years. Before even leading the way and yeah. before the church, I was involved in another ministry where I was training Christian leaders uh, from the Muslim world, the Arabic-speaking world. It's always, um, you know, that's my roots, so even though I literally... When I escaped from there, I want nothing to do with that part of the world, but God had changed my heart. And so I've been involved uh, almost 50 years now, mm. almost 50 years mm. in the Muslim world. Mm. So 
we're going to focus on that. Uh, we have a, a dedicated television channel, Kingdom Sat, mm -hmm. 24-7, 260 plus million homes. Mm -hmm. And now is watched in Australia and New Zealand and mm -hmm. all over the world. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to intensify that work as well as um, may even make personal visits to these places. Mm. And our follow-up team is beefed up, so mm. they'll be available 24-7 to respond to inquirers and people who want to know Christ. Mm. So reaching with the teaching through television, through radio, uh, personal visitation, yeah. making sure that literature and discipleship courses are, are going out, j similarly to what we just talked about in the U.S., Exactly. the need for churches and, and follow-up people to come alongside to right. give support. So there's your two pillars, and there's a third pillar, which has been around, Yes. yes. but maybe hasn't gotten the focus attention. or attention yes. that, that yes. perhaps the other two may have gotten. And Jonathan, you remember you have been part of this yeah. from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. I remember when you came back from Albania mm -hmm. and when you came back from Turkey and when you came back from um, Indonesia. Indonesia, my goodness, you went to places <laughs> that yeah. nobody even goes to. Right. So remote. Very remote. And uh, desperate. And you brought the need to our attention 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing the incredible success of this little gizmo called the Navigator, yeah. where thousands upon thousands of people in remote areas in Indonesia mm -hmm. and in, mm -hmm. in Bangladesh, in uh, Africa, in Ethiopia, and many other countries, mm -hmm. because it's in 28 languages, where they take this thing and literally hang it on a tree because it's solo operated, mm -hmm. doesn't need plugging, doesn't mm -hmm. need electricity. Mm -hmm. And that serves two purposes. Not only that reach those remote people who are desperately in need of the gospel, right. but it also reaches the people who may be illiterate, yeah. that they can't read. Yeah. Now, yeah. we won't say, just send them the Bible. Yeah. Okay, well, great, let's send yeah. them the Bible. But if they can't read it, what would they do? And the lack of uh, Bible teaching in those regions. So yeah. you may have someone who's been converted, who yep. has a passion and a desire, yeah. but there's no seminary or, or yeah. place where they can be taught the Bible rightly. Right. Yep. And I know that a lot of organizations are starting to do that, which is wonderful. But sure. in the meantime, what do you do for those people who are hungry and desperate? Exactly and don't have a pastor who can rightly divide the Word of God, yes. give it to them in their own exactly, native tongue. Exactly. That's why one of the pastors in uh, Indonesia, who literally takes truckload of these and goes into different villages, mm -hmm. I mean, he's one individual. Yeah. And uh, each one of those has the Bible in it in their language. Mm -hmm. And also it has about... 250 or so messages that I have preached through an interpreter. Mm -hmm. So my voice in English and then the voice of mm -hmm. Bahatha Indonesian mm -hmm. or yeah. Turkish or, Hindi, or any yeah, Hindi or languages. any of those languages that we've been broadcasting yeah. on. Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny, having been to those places, I mean, genuinely, these people are walking to the well to yeah. get water. Yes. And they would say, yeah. we listen to the teaching as we make our journey to go and get water and yeah. come back in. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, if we sit down with a meal with the family, we'll listen to the teaching. And right. it's such a unique tool that the Lord has graced us with. Absolutely. It's an invention of a missionary from Australia. He really got laid it on his heart and with the help of other technicians were able to do it. Now we're proliferating it, hopefully in the hundreds of thousands, mm. which if everyone gives mothers used by 10 people, you're talking about millions that will be, yeah. be able to reach. Well, it's interesting. Just as I'm kind of looking over these three things, I'm seeing lots of different soil types yes. here as I think about Jesus' parable on the soils. Right. You think of here in the West, which is becoming rockier and more yeah. difficult to penetrate. Uh, you think of the Islamic world, which has been Always difficult hard. and yep. hard, but yep. seems to be softening. And then you have these remote villages, which seems to be a more fertile ground. Yeah. And yet, the Lord doesn't say, don't sow into rocky soil, right. only sow where you think the soil will be right. good. He says, no, the farmer scatters the seed exactly. everywhere. Sure. Because you don't know where it will take root. And, and God where it will, will take begin. care of the results. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. One plants and other yeah. waters, but God gives the ground. Another way to see it, uh, Jonathan, is that uh, we are following the command of Jesus. When he gave what is known now as the Great Commission, 
he gave a sense of priority. Mm. He said Jerusalem mm. that came first, Smyrna, which is right mm. next door, mm. and the end of the world. Samaria to the other parts, parts of the world. Of the world. Yeah. So we're doing Jerusalem. Yeah. Then we're expanding a little bit to Samaria, and then to the other most of and the most remote corners of the globe. Yeah. Yeah. And so following the command of our Lord is something that it's been challenged to me and to obey and how to go about it. Yeah. But he showed us a way now, so we're grateful for that. Yeah. And just to bring it all full circle, even the concept behind this of the idea of the open door campaign, yes. it originated from the sermon exactly. that brought from, you into the kingdom. From Yes, exactly. Mm. How long will the door remain open? This is uh, the thing. I mean, yeah. I don't know how the door is going to be remaining open right. in America before we hear that the Bible is a hate speech. Mm. It's already in some countries, mm-hmm. like in Finland mm-hmm. and other European countries, where they just said, well, son, the Bible is hate speech. Mm-hmm. And even a member of parliament in Finland mm-hmm. was taken to court mm-hmm. because she quoted the Bible. Mm-hmm. Then it's happening in Sweden and Scandinavia and many other countries, and we don't know how long it's going to be here. Yeah. Uh, certainly, it's beginning to bud in Canada. Yeah. So we would love to walk through that mm. door as long as God keeps it open yeah. and take advantage of it. Mm. Because if we go to sleep, yeah. we'll wake up and we have missed a great opportunity. Yeah. And so, and you know, as I get on and, and the years keep uh, piling up, I feel that I'm really putting my foot on the accelerator now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're grabbing more handfuls of seeds and scattering wider and further. Um, the Open Door Campaign, five-year plan to passionately proclaim uncompromising truth in three strategic areas, North America, the Muslim world, and remote villages. This is uh, very exciting, and um, we'll be praying for uh, the work. Thank we know you. that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few, and so... Amen. We're grateful that uh, the Lord's put this on your heart. And, well, I'm grateful uh, for you, Jonathan, and now I can see that uh, the Lord is going to extend this yeah. beyond my life Well, wow. and you. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to share this with us. And uh, if you want more information about the Open Door campaign, you can visit ltw.org, ltw.org. Candid is a podcast from Leading the Way with Dr. Michael Youssef. Don't forget to connect with our social media pages on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And subscribe to Candid Conversations on your favorite podcast platform so you never miss an episode. While there, please leave a review. It does help people find us. As always, thank you for listening to and sharing this episode.